Thanks for joining us today. We love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So we encourage you to share your story with us at info at fellowshipgg.com. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact you, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do that online at fellowshipgj.com and pick the giving option that works best for you. And help us continue to bring the message of Christ to our community and beyond. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy today's message. I'm very glad that you're here with us today as we start this series. You know, God has a plan for you, and it's full of goodness, and it's not full of destruction or calamity. It's, it's for good. At least that's what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. But I've spoken to so many people who, in our community, but not just in our community, even in this room, I've spoken to so many people um, who are living in hopelessness. You know, am I ever going to get where I'm supposed to be? Am I ever going to get things right? Is life ever going to work out for me? I wonder, have you ever felt a sense of hopelessness? Have you ever felt discouraged because you thought you'd be farther along? Well, over the next couple of weeks, we are going to be uh, getting into this series, discussing hope and, and, and really hoping and praying that God would breathe life and hope and direction into our lives. And my assignment today, my, my sermon today is taken from just one scripture. Uh, but I don't believe that there's another scripture uh, that can better encourage us and, and help us on our journey as we continue to follow Jesus. And I wonder how many of you in this room today could use a little bit of encouragement? Yeah. The, the, then the people next to you that just raised their hands said they could use a little encouragement. Give them a little shake and tell them, get ready to receive some encouragement today. Because I've got good news that God's word tells us today. We're going to look here in Jeremiah chapter 29. I know many of you, you, you know the verse, you've heard the verse, you've read the verse. Some of you have the verse on the wall in your house. But we're going to see what God has to say about our hope. He says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Wow. You start to feel a little bit better right now, right? He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. But yeah, there's some of us in here going, well, at least someone knows the plans. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know the plans, but, but he does. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope. And a future. Have you ever seen someone who lost their hope? People lose their hope because they lose sight of their future. And it's my hope and my prayer today that God would breathe life into you today and that you would leave here encouraged, that you would leave here pumped up, that you'd leave here full of hope. And over this journey of this next couple of weeks, that we would begin to recognize how even when things feel hopeless, that we have a hope in him. So would you talk to our Heavenly Father with me today? Let's invite him into this room before we dive into this. Heavenly Father, uh, it's about you. We're in this room because of Jesus. We're in this room because of what you've done for us, and we pray today that you would speak to us. God, I pray for the discouraged in this room. I pray for people um, uh, who, who maybe this isn't for them today, but but God is for a season coming up or a season they've just come out of. I pray that you would speak to all of us and that you would breathe life into us today. Help us to leave here changed, looking more like you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wonder, have you ever felt disoriented and confused? Have you? I can tell you there's been, um, over the last 10 years, there's, there's literally been thousands Thousands of times I've walked through this auditorium uh, on a daily basis. I, I have to come back here because, I mean, I have my office and our office wing, but there's also like a pre-service room back here uh, that whoever's speaking uh, for the weekend uses to, to pray and to get ready and to kind of uh, get their last-minute thoughts together before we come out on stage. And, and I'll, I'll bring stuff back and forth between my office and this uh, room. We call it the green room. And, and, and so we... 
we have stuff in both places, and there's a lot of times where I remember, like, where's my favorite blue pin? I can't find my pin. So I will just, like, I get distracted through the weekend, let's be honest. So I will come through here literally. And I, over, over the last 10 years, literally thousands of times I've come in through here. Now, for those of you that don't know much about tech systems, um, you might not know that to turn the lights on in this room is not as easy as coming in and just flipping a switch. I mean, you've got to come in and you've got to boot up a computer system and then boot up a light board and you've got to wait for them to warm up and get ready. And then once those have initialized, then you can start the process of bringing up whichever lights you want. Uh, so for a period of time, it was like, it would be a huge waste of time because I would come in here and boot the system up for like 10 minutes, go get my blue pin and then come back out and shut it down for 10 minutes, like 20 minutes to get a pin. I could have ran to the store and bought a stinking pin, right? So... I finally got to the point where I've, I've come through here enough to where I'm like, I don't really need um, to, to turn the lights on anymore. I can figure this out. And I, I started coming through this set of doors over here. And I, I'd walk down, and I, I knew once I got to the bottom of the first ramp, and like I got a, a little bit of flat. And then I come to the second ramp, I'd be on the floor, and I could turn all hard left. And I could walk until I hit the wall, hit a staircase. Yeah, like I, I put my hands out in front of me, you know. <laughs> I put a staircase right there. As soon as I get up to the top of the staircase, you could see light from backstage. And it's like I would come through here for, for years. I would come through here in the dark. I don't need no stinking light in here to get through this room. This is how often I've done this. But it was one Wednesday afternoon that I remember I had to get my blue pen. So uh, I was kind of in a hurry, and I just got to run backstage. I actually think I was looking for my, uh, my speaking Bible. I have one that I really like to have with me uh, for, for weddings and funerals and stuff like that. So uh, I remember I was kind of, I was in a hurry, and I was coming through here, and I opened that side door. It's pitch black in this room, and, and I start, like, hauling down. I'm like, here's the first ramp, the first flat, the second ramp, the second flat. And then I took a hard left, and it was right at that time that something swung out and hit me in the knee so hard that I did a complete flip. It was like a ninja move. I'm sure it was like perfect if we would have had it on camera. And I landed on my back and holding my knee, just trying to hold back all the words you're not supposed to say in church, right? <laughs> I'm laying there on the ground, just, just writhing, going, what happened to me? And I'm, I'm laying there, I'm looking, it's pitch black. And I'm thinking, like I, normally I would just pop straight back up from something like this, but I don't know. Did I just get attacked? I think like someone Nancy Kerrigan me, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm laying on the ground freaking out, going, what just happened to me? And, and after a couple of moments, the, thank God the air conditioner turned on, and when it did, one of these curtains blew just a little bit, and there was a little bit of light that shined in from backstage, and it hit me in the eye, and all of a sudden, I, I wasn't disoriented anymore. I had a sense of direction. I, had, I, I knew which way to go. That beacon of light to me for just a moment, it seems like a dramatic stretch, but I, I guess I felt like, like like, I know the encouragement it must have been for sailors who would be out at sea. And it was a pitch black night. It was this darkness. There's clouds covering the stars. The moon's not out. It's dark. You don't know which way to go. And then somewhere off on the horizon, you see a lighthouse. And it's that, that light that brings direction, that brings hope, that brings encouragement. I was confused. I was disoriented before. I was in darkness. But now I know which way to go. I think for every one of us in this room, we would agree that we are in very, very dark times. That on every level, darkness is creeping in. Darkness is creeping into our individual lives. It's creeping into our, our marriages, to our families, to our relationships. We, we live in co political confusion. We live in, in, in a culture right now of depravity. We, uh, we live in a world right now where there is darkness on every single time. And it's in the, in the midst of darkness. It's in the midst of hopelessness, hopelessness. It's in the midst of discouragement that we find God speaking to his people here. This powerful verse that we're looking at today. Jeremiah 29, 11, that says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. That God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 is a very well-lit verse. But it's a well-lit verse in the middle of a very dark chapter. Because if you know anything about the book of Jeremiah, you know that in Jeremiah, this, the, the prophet of the Lord, Jeremiah, is speaking to a group of people who... Um, who were really, they were in rebellion against God and they were being punished for their rebellion, so they were in exile. So the entire book of Jeremiah is written to a group of people who, for, for all intents and purposes, they were being spanked. They were in trouble because of their rebellion, because of turning towards idols, because of not being faithful to the Lord, because of their disobedience. They had found themselves in a place where, where now they, they were in what was called exile, where they were removed from Jerusalem. They were taken into captivity in, in many areas. They're, they were pulled away from their homeland. They're now living in a pagan culture. Their families are beginning to fray apart. Their, cultural, their culture and their economy is falling apart. Everywhere they looked around them, was what they had hoped for was falling apart. So we have a group of people who love God, yet they're beginning to become hopeless. They're beginning to think, I don't, I don't see a, a future here. Because day after day, month after month, year after year, I, I, I still love God, but my circumstances haven't changed. Uh, I still love God, but I'm still stuck in the exact same place. And, and, and not, not to mention the fact that they're, they're in trouble, and it's their own sin that got them to where they are. Now they're, they're working in pagan work environments. They're working for companies that don't let them talk about God. That, I mean, they could lose their job. They could lose their life for talking about God. They're, they're in a pagan culture. And then on top of all of that, we see that the Bible says here, with in a pagan land, bleak circumstances, no end in sight, on top of all of this, even the preachers were leading them astray. Even the people who were supposed to be encouraging and talking about God's word and what God says were leading them astray. We see Jeremiah 29, 8 says this. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. So there, there are people who see the need, they see the hopelessness, and they're trying to bring encouragement, and they're trying to abuse the fact that, that, that there's a nation of people who are discouraged and, and looking for hope. So they start saying things that God didn't say, and God's saying, listen, I didn't say that. Like, they're trying to give you hope, and they're trying to encourage you, and it's a lie right now, because what they're saying is not true, and I don't want you to get your hopes up on something that's not true right now. So, you know, if you just come to church, then nothing wrong is ever going to happen. If you just start following Jesus, you're never going to struggle in your marriage. If you just get saved, you won't have temptations anymore. You know, if you just serve God, then you won't get sick. That's false teaching. It's false prophecy. It, it's not true. It's never been true. It's never going to be true, but... The children of Israel were listening to whatever they would hear, could hear because they, they were starving. And when you're hungry, when you're hopeless and you're starving, you will eat anything. I mean, there's some of you in here, you're health nuts. And it's like, you'll, you'll, you'll go on a fast for a couple of days. Before the fast, you think, I would never, ever eat that Twinkie. I would never eat that candy bar. You go on a fast, and, and then a couple of days in, it's like you're dreaming about the Twinkie, Right? Like, you'll eat anything when you're hungry. On the opposite end of this, I mean, there's been times where I've gone, like, I've gone on a workout, Omni and I have gone for a run. At the end of this run, it's been like a whole two and a half hours since I've ate, and I'm just like, I'm thinking, seriously, I'm close to death right now, you know? <laughs> Dear God, help me, and she's eating something. Like, I need some of that. I reach in the bag, you know, like, what is this amazingness? It's awesome. And she goes, Dan, it's kale. I'm like, ugh, <laughs> Because you'll eat anything when you're starving. And here, we've got prophets, preachers who 
see hurting people and they're, they're trying to encourage them and they're trying to like use them and abuse them and manipulate them. And so they're saying, uh, we're going to get out of this in no time. Today, today's the day for your breakthrough. We're, we're, we're going to get out of this. So let me pause for a moment. Does God do miracles? Yes. Can, can God give you a breakthrough immediately? Yes. The, can God get you out of your situation immediately? Yes, absolutely. But what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is to imply that following Jesus means that you're not going to have any problems in life is a lie. And it causes you to lose hope. It causes you to be discouraged. And in fact, we, we know it's a lie. We know that's not the truth because Jesus himself says it. He says here in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble. You'll hear people say, oh, you just start following Jesus and you're never going to have any problems anymore. Wait a minute. Jesus just said, if you follow me in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. So even the preachers were lying to the Israelites. So here we are. Desperate situation, negative circumstances. They're under divine discipline. They live in a pagan land, work in pagan work environments, and they're being led astray on every single level. There was darkness in this dark chapter, but in this dark chapter, I still have a very well-lit verse. In this hopelessness, in this discouragement, in this pain, in this confusion, this not knowing what to do, I still have a very well-lit verse because God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. You know, maybe you're here today and you're feeling hopeless. You feel like you don't know which way to go. You know, how do you find this hope? How do you get hope back when you, when you feel like you've lost hope? How do you get it back? Well, if God says, I know the plans I have for you, we need to pause and look at this because why is that important? If God says, I know the plans I have for you, it means he has a plan. He still has a plan. And for some of you, this is why you got out of bed today. And this is what you need to know is it doesn't matter how bleak your circumstances, it doesn't matter how bad your past is, it doesn't matter how bad you messed up last night or on the way here today, God still has a plan for you. And it's important that we stop and we recognize this is the word of God himself to you. Not just to me, not just to the church, not just to the, the nation of Israel back in, in during the exile, but to every single person that is his follower, that reads his word, that trusts in Jesus. He says, I know the plans I have for you. But th there's a problem with this. A, God knows the plan, but I don't know the plan. So you do, oh, well, that's great. God, I'm glad you know the plan. But the problem is also the solution. Because the greatest lessons in faith that you will ever learn will be learned in the dark. I don't think that that's something any one of us want to hear. It doesn't feel very encouraging, but God says, I know the plans. And you feel, well, I feel like I'm left out of the plan. I'm, I'm left in the dark. I, I don't know the plan. Well, the, many times... It's, it's in the darkness when, when we learn the most about God. It's when God takes us to places where we just don't understand. It's when God is ticking you off the most that you have to start trusting him even the more. He says, I know the plans I have for you. It may look dark. It may look unclear. It may, it may look pitch black. It may look bleak. But hold on, because when I move, you're going to know it. When I move, you're going to see it. Plans to give you a hope. We have to clarify what is hope. Hope is joyful expectation about the future. Hope is, is, is never focused on your current circumstances. Hope is never focused on the past. Hope is always forward looking. It's anticipation about the fact that my future will be better than my past. 
So, so hope is all about your future. And, and God's saying, I have a plan for your future. I have a plan for where I'm taking you, that your, your future is going to be better than your past. Because you look and you say, wait a minute, I'm in a circumstance right now that's not that great. And, and like, how can I have hope? Well, hope has nothing to do with your current circumstance. Hope has everything to do about where God is bringing you. See, when you got ready to come to church this morning, um, the first thing you did pulling out of the driveway is you grabbed that little rear view mirror and you looked into it and you started backing out. And you need that. When you're driving your car, you have to look backwards sometimes. There's a very small mirror there. But let me encourage you so you don't hurt yourself or so you don't hurt me driving down the road. Uh, don't spend too much time staring into that rear view mirror while you're driving. Because in life, we recognize even in a car, there is a much bigger tool in front of us, a window called a windshield that is much bigger than the little rearview mirror. Why? Because where you're going is so much better than where you've come from. And what God wants you to know, he's saying, I have a plan for you. It's to give you a hope in the future. It doesn't matter about your past. You say, because you don't know my past. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what pain I've been through. You don't know what I've done. That's in the past. It doesn't matter because God's saying, I'm talking about your future and your hope and where I'm taking you. So rip the daggum rear view mirror off the window and start looking forward. He said, I have a plan for you to give you a hope and a future. So regardless of your circumstances right now, do you know that God has a plan for you? Say, so, well, okay, well, if God has a plan, that's great. Then what do I do? Do I just sit back and, and wait for the plan? Do I just, just do nothing? Well, if we go back to verse 5, God gives us a little more information. Tells us a little bit about what we're supposed to do when we don't know what to do, when we feel hopeless, when we feel confused. He says this in verse 5. He says, I want you to build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. So in, in the midst of a bleak situation, in the midst of a bad work environment, in the midst of a marriage where there feels like all the joy is gone, what am I supposed to do? I want you to build houses and settle down and plant gardens and eat what they produce. I want you to become as productive as you possibly can. Do not sit and just do nothing. I want you to eat what, they produ what their gardens produce. That means I want you to maximize your potential. If there's anything that you can do, do that. There's too many of us that while we're waiting on God to do something, we just sit around here, I'm just waiting on the Lord. God's going to just come through today. Today's going to be my day. Well, what are you doing? He's waiting on you to do something. Do something. Like, the only time you don't do anything is when there's absolutely nothing that you can do. But is he, if he's giving you anything to do, as small as it may be, do that little thing. And it's when you do that little thing, you go, wait a minute. Like, how, how could this little thing even be effective? How could it even help? It's because you don't know the rest of the story. You don't know the rest of the plan. I know the plan, but you don't know the rest of the plan, so I gave you a little something to do, and I'm waiting for you to do that so I can continue on towards the plan. What is it that God has given you to do that you haven't done yet? So I want you to do that with all of your might. He goes on and says, I want you to marry and have sons and daughters and wives uh, find wives for your sons and give your, uh, your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase the number there. Do not decrease. He first says, I want you to be productive. Then he says, I want you to multiply. Be as fruitful as you possibly can. Even though you're in a pagan work environment, even though you're surrounded by people who don't love Jesus, I want you to be as productive and as fruitful as you possibly can. And this is why he explains it. Verse 7, also seek peace and prosperity in the city which I have carried you into exile. So he's saying, find out how to be a blessing, okay? How, how can I be a blessing where I am right now? This is why. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you will prosper. If it prospers, you will prosper. Guys, there's a key here. Do not miss this key. You set yourself up to be blessed by being a blessing to other people. 
Say, but my, you don't know where I work. You don't know the work environment. You don't know. He's saying, listen, I put you there, so make it prosper. Because if you can become a blessing there, then I can bless you right where you're at. You think, oh, I just, I need a different job. I need to get out of this place. Maybe he puts you there to be a blessing there. The key is you are being a blessing. You are setting yourself up to be blessed. See, one of the reasons that we stay stuck sometimes is because we spend too much time focused on ourselves. It's all about me. I'm stuck here. It's just been bad. You don't understand what's going on with me and myself and, like, and the way I feel. You know, my feelings. It's just, it's got, I got this going on. And it's like, you, you know, it's like you're telling me to do this and do that, but you don't know what it's like for me. Yeah? It's, it's me. And I've seen people come out of really, really funky situations, funky ways of thinking by getting this principle right about being a blessing to others. When you, when you stop focusing on me in a certain way, how can I serve others? How can I bless others? How can I start, okay, you know what? I am going to start serving. I'm going to start going to the hospital and visiting people who are, who are hurting right now. I'm going to start serving our children's ministry. I'm going to, I'm going to start giving my time and, and, and serving a hospice. I'm going to start serving however I can. I'm going to start being a blessing to others. And then all of a sudden, you, know, you don't hear any talk about me anymore. This talk is like, thank God I'm not going through what they're going through. Lord Jesus, like you have blessed me so much. It turns the focus there. And he's saying the, the, the key here is by being a blessing to others, you're setting yourself up. To be blessed. See, God says, I have a plan. So I don't want you to go looking for the plan. I want you to go looking for me. Jeremiah 29, verse 12. Once we do all this, once we're being productive and multiplying and being a blessing, he says this, then you will call on me. Guys, don't miss this verse. Then you will call on me. And come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Man, isn't that good? You, you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That, that is enough to just do a backflip over, but the problem is so many of us, we get this verse wrong, and we have it flipped, and, and we, we read it like this. We read it like, you, you will... Find the solution when you seek the solution with all of your heart. If you seek the solution, then of course you're going to find the solution with all your heart. And God's saying, no, 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 no. Stop looking for the plan. Stop looking for the solution. Start looking for me. Don't look for the plans because I have the plans. I know where I put them. You ain't going to find the plans. You got to find me. So when you seek me, you're going to find me. The whole point is about us coming closer to our Savior. The whole point of the discipline that the Israelites were going through is that he wanted them to just come back into a loving relationship. He's saying, just come back to me. Come seek me. But it can feel sometimes when, when we can't see what God is doing, like then we just assume automatically God isn't doing anything at all. See, the man went to sleep. And God cut away his side. I said, wait a minute. I, I thought the, he cut Adam's rib out, right? But the Hebrew word for rib is also the Hebrew word for side. So literally, Adam is laying there half the man he used to be, okay? God cut away Adam's side while he was asleep. And, and he goes away, and the Bible uses a word in Hebrew. It actually means fashion. He, 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 he took the side and he fashioned. Fashion means to build specifically for a purpose and for an, an intention. He fashioned a woman together. Now, when it talks, men, let's talk for a second. When it talks about how he built a man, it doesn't use the same Hebrew word as fashion. It's like basically he took dirt and he like threw it together and like, bam, there you go. But, but for a woman... It says he fashioned, and then, 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 then he, 
He woke the woman up. He breathed life into her. He created her. And and see, the woman didn't know anything about the man. I know this because the Bible says that God brought her to Adam, that God brought Eve to Adam. So it's not like she woke up looking for a man. It's not like, oh, I'm 35 and I'm not married yet, you know? (laughs) None of that. She just wakes up and she knows her creator and says, okay. And then... And then God takes her to Adam, and Adam goes, whoa, man. (laughs) See, the whole time, the whole time Adam was asleep, that's when God was doing his best work. And and there's some of you that, that you're asleep. You're in the dark. You don't know what's going on around you, and it can feel like sometimes when you don't know what God is doing around you that he's not doing anything at all but he says I know the plans I have for you over the last several years my daughters have been involved in dance that's what we do in the Hooper household we dance we dance well I don't dance I pay for dance but uh (laughs) but there's a lot of dance going on every once in a while I will just pull out the sprinkler in front of my daughters just to really make them mad you know but uh they're both advancing. They're both doing wonderful. And I remember my, my older daughter, Rachel, um, we, we, would, we would talk to her director about what was taking place, about her ad- advancements and stuff like that. And the director said, uh, you know, uh, we want to advance her to the next level, but it's going to be a while because she's got to learn these skills. She's got to get stronger here. She's got to do this. She's got to do that. So I have a plan for her, but it's going to take some time. Okay? This is what we knew that the director, the one in charge, said about our daughter. She had a plan. It's going to take time. And then we, what happened after that was the fact that my daughter, who used to bounce into the car and be all excited about dance, and she just couldn't shut up about what was going on. We had so much fun, and we did this, and we did that, and this is the whole ride home, just so excited. It's like now she was getting quieter and quieter and quieter every week after she got out of dance class, and we finally just started asking her, what is going on with you? Because you look sad. You look like you're upset. What is going on right now? I thought you loved dance. And, and she finally, in tears, just started breaking down and going, you know, all my friends are telling me it's time for me to move up to the next next level and they keep telling me surely next week she's going to advance you to the next level next week this is going to be the week next week she's going to move you to the next level you're going to get there you're going to get there so I keep thinking this is the week and I show up and it doesn't happen my daughter is sitting there crying because the bible says in proverbs 13 12 that hope deferred makes the heart sick And we had to have a real conversation with her where we said, listen, it's going to happen. You're going to advance, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take longer than you think. So there's a couple things that need to happen. You need to, first of all, go back to having fun. You need to go back to being productive and learning and growing right where you are so that you can advance. And and then number three, stop listening to the stupid little twits that are telling you all these lies because they have no idea what they're talking about. It would be 70 years before the Israelites came out of exile. False prophets tell them, two, three years max. That's it. We're getting out of here. Two, three years max. It would be 70 years. And God's saying, no, I didn't say that. Stop giving false hope. Stop trying to tell my people something that's not true. So, because then they're walking around, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But then my daughter learned something. She learned I could have fun right where I am. I need to stop waiting to have fun for the next level. I need to start living life and having fun now. And there's some of you in here that your hope has been deferred because you're wanting suddenly. You're wanting like right now, I need my breakthrough. And like I've been praying that today would be the day and when it doesn't happen today, then we walk around with our heads down like, well, I guess I'm just, it's just this problem. I've been, I wanted the, the breakthrough in the job and I'm not getting it. And it's like, like I, I, I want my breakthrough. And see, let me tell you something. The, the truth about being a pastor, pastors love to teach on suddenly. Suddenly. In Acts chapter 2, suddenly the Holy Spirit came in like the sound of a rushing wind into the upper room. We see that the heavenly host showed up in Luke chapter 2 suddenly. We see in in Acts chapter 8 that Philip was taken up suddenly. That suddenly there can be breakthrough. 
If preachers love, I could tell you're a white crowd, but I could get you dancing on your feet. If, if I started preaching suddenly, suddenly today your marriage is going to come back. There's going to be intimacy in your marriage. Today your finances are coming through. Suddenly your kids are going to start following Jesus. Suddenly these things are going to happen. And don't get me wrong, our God is a God of suddenly and he can do miracles today. He could be, you, you could wake up not knowing that today could be the day that suddenly, and he can do that today, but that's not the word that he had for the people in Jeremiah 29. The word he had for them is that this is going to take a while. This is going to take a while. It's going to take seven years. So what would it look like for those people who are like, like I'm going to wait to be happy. I'm going to wait from my breakthrough, because after all, I mean, it could be tomorrow, so I'm, I'm going to wait to start being productive. I'm going to wait to start having kids. I'm going to wait to start doing these things in my life, because, because some of the day is coming is 70 years later. Was, God says, I know the plans. You don't know the plans. So I have a word for some of you today. And that's stop waiting to be happy. Stop waiting for your circumstance to change before you decide to be a blessing to other people. Stop waiting for circumstances to change before you'll start serving. Stop, stop waiting for, for somehow something's going to change and then you're going to be productive. No, he's saying right now in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of your confusion, I want you to be productive. I want you to be a blessing. I want you to multiply. I want you to do what you can do right now because it might still be a while and I can still bless you right now so the bible says i know the plans i have for you but i don't know the plans myself so i I don't like being in the dark well i can't help you with that because hebrews 11 6 says and without faith it is impossible to please god because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he will reward those who earnestly seek him So if you don't know which way to go, seek him. If you feel like you're in the dark, seek him. If if you're in pain, seek him. If you're confused, seek him. If you're tired of waiting, seek him. Don't come to me and ask me because I don't know the plans he has for you. I'm going to send you right back to him. you got to seek him. He's saying, if you come and seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. you got to seek him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ put up the payment for the plan. And he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What that tells us is what God starts, he finishes. What he begins, he ends. What he initiates, God completes. He say, but I'm in a mess and you don't know my mess. Then I'm telling you, then you don't know my God. Over these next couple weeks, we're going to talk about hope. I want to encourage you today, before we leave, if you can't remember the sermon, remember the verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. To give you a hope and a future. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we take this journey of learning how to follow you, even though... Sometimes it feels like we're in the dark. I pray that you would breathe life into us, that you would bring hope back to us, that we would stop looking for the plans and we would start looking for you. I pray that today would be a day where people decide to leave here and say, I'm no longer going to wait to be happy. I'm no longer going to wait to be productive. I'm no longer going to wait to be a blessing. But in the midst of where I am right now in these dark, dark circumstances, I'm going to look to hoping in you and following you. Thank you for every person here, God. I pray that we would leave here changed. I pray that your word would affect us deeply this week as we walk out of this place. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. 
The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can do that right now. I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. And God, I thank you for that. I ask you now to be my savior, to guide my life, and to give me a home forever in heaven. And God, I ask you this in your precious son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed this prayer for the first time, or if you need prayer, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY or at prayer at fellowshipgj.com. Thanks again, and we hope to see you next week.